So welcome everyone for this pre-lunch session. Uh, I think some of the discussion we're going to hear now was anticipated in the last one, because this is about, people thought I heard when I came and someone was asking, oh, I don't really want to be an academic. So what else can I do if I don't want to uh, be a lawyer? And so this is, this is a, a session about that crossover space between litigation and advocacy. Uh, and we have a panel, of, um, I, should, I should say a collective speaking panel. Uh, it's a lecture, and it's going to be delivered collectively in Surrey Autumn by the three speakers. All three speakers uh, today are trained lawyers and have now gone on to do uh, very interesting things in the world of advocacy. And we hear more about their organization, which is called NSDEEP, which they were co-founded together um, a few years ago. And the organization has won international recognition. One of the speakers today has also been named as one of the 100 most influential women in uh, by the Guardian, no less. So, welcome to all of you. And I, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, all of you. I, I start with our first speaker of the three. Um, and our first speaker is Jeshree Sakhiti. And uh, Jeshree is, uh, as I said, she's one of the founders of this organization, Women's Deep. And uh, has has trained as a lawyer, has done trained for some incredible litigation work, which is landmark in getting uh, you know home, uh, getting homes for pregnant homeless women uh, a shelter by the state. Uh, so the work is the the, the, the organisation is the works in creating a body of paralegal work uh, uh, paralegals in North, in North India and Delhi in particular, and in Assam and the northeast. And their work primarily revolves around um, in, you know, uh, legal empowerment in the area of uh, women's reproductive rights and women's health, as well as uh, labor rights in tea plantations. So Jeshri is the first speaker, and as I said, she's, um, she's an author of, uh, of, 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 of a book, uh, and has contributed um, a lot of, a lot of uh, articles and papers on the right to save motherhood. Uh, and uh, has, as I said, won a landmark case for Court of its own versus Union of Our second speaker is Francesca Ferrugno, and Francesca is uh, at the moment a researcher based at IDS in Sussex, and her, she is a human rights uh, lawyer and trained, uh, activist by, by, by training. Not a lawyer. No, no lawyer, but just a human rights uh, a researcher and activist, and she too is involved with this thing and has this work in these areas, in the sound especially around, uh, around accountability. And our third speaker is Sukti Gita. And Sukti is the executive director of Nasti. And uh, she too, uh, like her colleagues here, has worked immensely in creating this, this body of family workers in the SAM, especially around tea plantations, and um, has also, like uh, Jeshri, won, um, uh, has, has been involved in a lot of landmark litigation, in, especially around Lakshmi Mandra versus being there, Hari Nagar Hospital, again, which was the first decision in the world to recognize maternal mortality as a human rights violation. So we have an impressive set of speakers, and I shall take their time over to you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for attending this lecture today, and thank you for Transnational Law Summer School Institute 2016 <laughs> for giving us this opportunity to speak today. Um, so each of us will take 10, 10 minutes uh, roughly, and then this will be followed by Q and A. You know, quite a bit one. I'm one, so <laughs> you're stuck with me. Now. <laughs> so just to say, Nasdik, um, as uh, as Kriti mentioned, Nasdik um, is a legal empowerment organization, and we are committed to bring access to justice closer to the marginalized communities. Don't worry if, it, if that sentence doesn't make any sense right now, because we will kind of do the talk. Just to give a little bit of more background uh, about me is um, I come from a small town called Chandrapur, the state of Maharashtra, India. There are several lawyers in my family, but I'm the first one to practice uh, human rights. Don't get me to um, I started my career by uh, uh, working with a leading legal aid organizations who specialize in public interest litigation. Now, public interest litigation is a unique, is very unique to India. 
uh, it was um, it was um, created by courts in late uh, 1970s, um, enabling giving power to individuals, civil society organizations, or any other NGOs to file a case uh, in in uh, in instance of. Um, um, a human rights violation, you know, uh, of a public interest. Um, while I did, um, I, I started as a junior lawyer at that organization, over five years became a director of litigation with, with, with responsibility of filing public interest litigations uh, on behalf of uh, organizations and individuals. Was doing a very cutting edge work, interesting work, um, filing cases on several issues, um, and managed to get good decisions, as you know, as given as um, as a uh, few. Um, but we came across um, many hurdles, and one of them were that even if we managed to, in spite of all odds, like community come with like weak paperwork, if there's no background as to knowing that they will have to file a litigation. Um, after doing all the background work in managing to get a good, strong decision, the major hurdle was to get the decision made. And in, especially in instances where communities weren't directly involved in litigation, they uh, had very limited understanding how the judicial structure worked, how the administrative structure worked to get those decisions implemented with the poor uh, uh, literacy levels uh, one of the, I'll give you one example um, of, a, of, a, um, of a case where we got a very good decision. Um, is in 2010, um, uh, Delhi uh, was hosting Commonwealth Games. And the government decided that there are two stadiums in two different parts of the city and they want to connect them by constructing underpass. And on the, on, um, um, along the way, there was a community who had been there for 70 years. Um, and out of the blue, the, the government shows up with a bulldozer and, and evict them without due process, without any notice, without, uh, without giving rehabilitation. Um, we came to know about this, uh, about the instance, we went to the, uh, we went to the field, we met the evictees, and on, um, decided to file a petition on their behalf before the Delhi High Court. We managed to get a very good decision, a groundbreaking decision, uh, in fact, which uh, set the process of um, due process for it's very due process for um, for cases uh, in cases of eviction, um, giving them relief, uh, a time bound, a time bound direction to the government to uh, to determine the eligibility of the community, and because of the decision, like it, it kind of paved way for many other communities from. Uh, from them to, to go to court to claim, um, claim right of housing. Uh, but 2010, how many? Six years, six, seven years, they were within 2009. Um, six years later, they're still living along the sewage line. This is one of the families uh, amongst 21 families who are still waiting for the rehabilitation. This, this decision has been cited at, in, in the literature by UN, it's been celebrated everywhere. But when you look at real people, real change, Nothing has happened, and and this is just one instance. There are other decisions which, again, like after so much effort, so many effort, and um, you see that it doesn't bring real change in lives of people. What it is a judicial victory, and it remains like that. And it uh, it kept on adding to, to frustration uh, because um, the work was satisfying at the level that you, you get your name on. When, when you see that it is not done anything to people, you just question the effort, question the system. Um, all three of us were working in the same organization as different, um, different, you know, cases. But then we found that over a year, we found that we, <laughs> we share the same frustrations. And we thought, why don't we try to change the, change the angle, change the perspective in which we are looking. Uh, we realize that it, it is a system like you know which I think works in other field of law, but does not work in human rights area specifically. Is a top-down approach. Client comes to you, papers, which is like you know, 
we just say what, what should be done, what should come out of the blah, blah, blah. And you get it done, and then just give the decision to the, to the community, where the community does not know what to do. Okay? In India, mostly they don't even know what it means, because most of it, uh, all of them are in, in English, high court and Supreme Court decisions, and they just don't know who to go to for law and how to get it. So we thought, why not to why not to try a bottom up approach where and where to um, to go local uh, to engage with the communities before they uh, before uh, they face uh, such violations. For example, in Delhi, uh, we work with uh, with four communities who live in slum um, and talk about what should they have, uh, what documents should they have. Ready with them. What are the criteria for the application? What are their rights um, in case if, if a bulldozer shows up in, in, in front of their community? Who can they call? You know, all that stuff. Um, and um, with that thought, we started Nazdik. Uh, Nazdik uh, means um, to bring clothes in. It's a Urdu word, it means to bring clothes, and we thought. Um, that there was a best word while we are working on uh, bringing access to justice close to communities. We got core focus on issues of um, health, uh, housing, nutrition, and and then labor got added to it. Um, <coughs> with that perspective, we wanted we we wanted to identify a community and an organization who. Um, where these issues uh, needed to be addressed uh, you know, through legal, um, legal recourse. And an organization who has a vision to kind of build legal capacity of their staff. So that took us to Assam, where the um, state has the highest maternal mortality, high infant mortality, um, high immunity. Um, and Assam, as, as we all know, we, the T comes from Assam. So Assam is a Francesca will give a little more background on Assam. Um, there we, we start with an organization called Pajna, which is, uh, which is a grassroots indigenous empowerment organization who works with uh, tea laborers and, and their families. We, we went there and we, we started working with women who were, who were tea plantation workers and we were like, you know, we talked about maternal health, nutrition, everything. And then we knew that they had not been paying you know, and then we, we ignored that for some time, like thinking as to what to do with it. But then we realized that unless we go into labor issues, we might not be able to get you know any to any logical conclusion. Only talking about it. Um, so that's how that's how labor uh, as an issue got introduced in our work. Uh, while um, after working for six seven months in the sun. Uh, we just couldn't ignore it. Um, Francesca will now go in specifically in the sound and you know, what are the conditions. Sure. 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 About Assam in the context uh, specifically as to health and labor, and why these two elements are so important, and also why they are so entrenched. Um, Assam is the largest tea growing region in the world. It produces half of India's tea production and, and about one sixth uh, of the of the entire world production. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure you are all familiar with Assam tea in, in the UK, especially Assam tea is used to make English breakfast blend. So it's very, it's very part of, of the tea culture here, as well as in India, obviously, uh, as well as being exported on other other markets. And we have very big multinational corporations like Tata Tetley, like Unilever, PG Leaves, uh, Thai Food, Twinings. They all source from from Assam, and indeed anyone who um, who makes English breakfast has to source from Assam. So um, the, the industry is very large, very profitable, very uh, fam famously known. But um, and also and locally, it employs about 800,000 workers who live on the plantations with uh, with their families. So in terms of uh, the tea garden 
population, if we want to call it that way, we are looking at about six million people. Um, out of these six, out of these eight hundred thousand workers, about half are are women, which is a, a quite a, a high percentage, quite a high ratio for India's organized sector. Um, and, and these workers were brought originally to Assam. They are not indigenous to Assam, but they were brought over uh, to this to the region from the central states of India, like Maharashtra, West Bengal, Orissa. So from the from the tribal uh, tracks, and and so they are um, ethnically they belong to the Adivasi. Um, the Adivasi is a name uh, that encompasses a range of tribes from uh, from uh, the central states of India. So during the British colonialism, they were brought over by the British to uh, to, to be employed as laborers in the gardens in, in Assam. Um, so though they are not indigenous to Assam, they still fall within the uh, definition, if you want to call it, of uh, indigenous. Now, um, I'm going to spend uh, the next few minutes showing you, bringing you virtually in a, in a, in a tea garden and showing you the, the working and living conditions. By the way, all of these um, multimedia that we are going to use now, if you look down, there's a link to uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So all of these um, uh, pieces of video 360 um, infographics that you are looking at now are part of a, uh, an online exhibition that we launched uh, online, but also offline, to, uh, to expose some of the issues and also to provide um, materials and, and content. So. Um, yeah, so this is a tea garden in Assam. It's a it's a it's a common it's a uh, common garden, and uh, as you see, women are, are mostly employed as uh, tea pluckers. So they need to pluck 24 kgs of tea leaves per day, which they put in, in those baskets that they carry on their on their backs. Um, and 24 kgs is not a legal requirement, by the way. It's something that managers uh, set as a requirement, but it's not provided in the law. And um, uh, for, for doing this, they are paid 126 rupees a day, which is about one pound 26. Uh, one pound before Brexit. So until two days ago, there was one pound 26. Uh, and one pound 26 is much below the legal minimum wage, which is the state minimum wage is 240 rupees, so two pound 40. So we have 126. The, wage actually paid against a legal minimum of 240 and that legal minimum is not uh, as calculated not to be enough to fulfill um, needs of, of families so um, it has been calculated that a living wage uh, is around 330 rupees so what they get is 126 and just think of the relation between 126 and 330 so if they don't meet the, the ducking requirements, uh, their wages are, 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 are cut. Um, and uh, the, so the Plantation Labor Act is the main piece of legislation that applies to, to the gardens. And it talks about minimum wage, and, but it also talks about living conditions and benefits that workers uh, living on the gardens with their families should have access to. Now, if we go to the next, the next one. I have to do that. No, I think, okay, sorry. Huh? Sorry. On here, yeah. Now, we, we okay, this is a, a, an average uh, garden quarter, so uh, one quarter of housing that is provided to all permanent workers, that should be provided to all permanent workers. And as you can see, there is no electricity, there is no water, there is no latrine. Uh, and the, 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 the place rests in very inadequate condition. Um, and this is this is the only facility that workers have um, to live with their families. Um, the woman that we see in the in the house, sitting in the house, is about eight months pregnant. Uh, her husband and her brother-in-law are both uh, working in the garden. And uh, despite having uh, been entitled to a number of benefits for her pregnancy and to you know to curb Assam's maternal mortality rate. 
she doesn't have access to any hospital, she had to go to hospital, she doesn't have access to antenatal care, she doesn't have access to supplementary nutrition and to a number of, uh, of benefits set in, in law. Um, now, if, if we look at, like, if we take this scenario, so uh, very low wages and, and such, uh, uh, such hurdles in assessing to basic services, Something that I always felt, especially when I was visiting the gardens at the beginning, is a sense of being really overwhelmed. And if you have to develop a legal strategy, you just wonder where to begin from, because there's so many issues that are so big and it's just, the context is so uh, heavy. So I think um, um, an exercise that, that I often apply uh, is, is to look at different power balances and power dynamics between actors and how do these uh, imbalances then underpin human rights violations. So what are, what are the dynamics between workers, the state and the plantation for example and how does these lead to uh, human rights violation and labor exploitation. And if, you, if we look, so there's different levels uh, that, we can, that we can look uh, at this from. Um, at, at the local level I think um, there's, there's three points. One is awareness. So workers are not aware of their rights. They not they don't know what their rights are, uh, and they, because they're isolated in uh, geographically, but also uh, from a cultural and ethnic point of view, they also lack the exposure to learn more about their rights and to gain access to existing remedies, be it administrative or, or judicial. And then the other element is, is the power relation between them and the manager. So even if they had uh, knowledge and awareness of their rights, they still wouldn't be in a position where they can challenge uh, the, the, the status quo. Um, I think we can show a, a, a short clip from a worker uh, that we interviewed in one of the gardens. <coughs> limited agency that individual workers on an individual uh, basis have. But then if we look at, at a more political um, level, at state level, workers also lack collective power. So wages are currently set through um, negotiations that are held once every three years. 
but between uh, the industry and uh, the union. And the Indian law provides for the main union to be so the one that has more members to be the only one um, able to represent workers during wage fixation. Um, and this union in Assam is, is called ACMS and it, it has historically been aligned with the industry uh, and is a, it has been also affiliated with the party that has been in power for the last few decades. Um, so that has created a, a, a situation for which the only union in charge of representing workers' interests has not done so. Um, then if we look at, again, we zoom out a little bit more and we look at, at the international level and at the global supply chain uh, perspective, um, there, are, there are wide disparities between actors along the supply chain. So, um, there's, a, there's a, a little graph that we can show to give you a sense of the limited power that workers have. So as you can see, tea pickers, which are at the bottom, this is like the overall profit uh, of a some uh, tea industry. And tea pickers are at the very bottom of 0.16%, whereas retailers and blenders, so these big brands, make together about 86% of the profit. So um, again, all of these different levels um, interact together and, uh, and, uh, and lead to this state of exploitation and, and uh, labor and freedom um, and, um, and other uh, violations. And this complex situation also requires a, 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 a complex, of course, strategy and multiple approaches. So my colleague Sukti will talk you through uh, some of those. Hello everyone. Um, is this on yet? Um, 40 minutes later I asked the question. Um, thank you everyone for this um, really wonderful opportunity. And I think in response to the, the challenges and the gaps that both Jayshree and Francesca talked about, um, our response, what are we doing here? Why are we here today? We're here to talk about what you can do as lawyers. What can you do within the framework that exists as activists, as researchers, and as traditional lawyers. What is the framework within which we can push <coughs> issues like this? And this is a case study of some of our work, which we believe can be applied in different contexts and different issues. Um, and I think on that, we have developed what we think is a tiered approach to respond to these kind of pressure points, whether they be at the local level, whether they're at the state level, or they're at the international level. And so we really take on a multifaceted tiered approach to that. Um, and it really centers on this notion of what's called legal empowerment. And that is about putting the law, or seeking to put the law in the hands of people. Very kind of general statement, but it's really about breaking down the legalese and helping to translate that to something that's meaningful for communities. So within the local framework, one of our key strategies is involves building um, community agency and the ability to claim rights. And one of the ways we do that is building up community paralegals. You're all in the law field, so I imagine you all know what paralegals are. Um, so I won't go into that, but basically they're not lawyers. It's, in our, in our case, our paralegals are tea workers, they are housewives, they are farmers, they are sometimes government health volunteers. And what we do is we spend at least a year with our paralegals doing intensive training programs. And that involves both substantive, which is rights-based understanding, the available government health entitlements or nutrition entitlements or private benefits that are um, applicable to, particularly in this case, tea garden workers. And also the skills, the practical tools. How do you conduct a fact-finding? How do you go into a government department and present a case civic education, behavioral learning, the whole kind of spectrum. And um, the woman we showed you earlier, that Francesca showed you, the eight-month pregnant woman, one of our paralegals, if she met her, she would be able to know what to ask. Are you a tea garden worker? How long have you lived here? Are you a permanent worker, casual worker? Um, how many months are you pregnant? All of the kind of scope of both legal and social kind of understanding, and then be able to we express what entitlements are being denied at the state level as well as at the private level. What's really unique in Assam is that 
the private companies, as Francesca mentioned, are really acting as quasi-state actors. So they not only provide kind of economic you know, salaries and things like that, very low, but they also provide health facilities, nutritional facilities, educational facilities, and then you've also got the arm of the state involved. So we really need to think about how those two things work together. And so at the end of that kind of exercise, our paralegals will be able to document that in some sort of basic report and make that be the basis of a complaint or potential litigation in the future. Um, the next element that we work on is, okay, so I should step back on that. In addition to kind of building up community paralegals, we're also seeking to bridge that gap between individuals and communities and this whole thing called lawyering. Right? And how do we do that is we really look at um, promoting pro bono legal support. Now, unlike, I'm a Nepali American lawyer, and unlike the US context, where there's a very kind of strong pro bono um, commitment, you know, uh, support, that doesn't really exist in India. India has a very nascent pro bono culture. Um, lawyers are incredibly overworked and under-resourced, not that they're not in other countries, but um, very much so. The, Bar associations do not promote it. You don't get any sort of CLE on it. Um, pro bono law, law firms do not really see it as a value uh, for their CR, CSR. So really you're working in an environment where um, legal professions don't see that as something they should be doing. So, um, and within the institutions, unlike I think King's and other universities, only the national law schools and wealthy private institu legal institutions have begun to build legal aid clinical programs into their curriculum. So with all of that in mind, we're in a rural part of the northeastern state of Assam, and none of those things exist. So what has been our strategy? It's been building, approaching the local law college there, which is called the Chipura Law College, which is a district level institution, and approaching the college to see if we could establish a human rights clinic that's dedicated, one, to kind of imbuing the notion of what does social justice mean, two, providing lectures and sessions both on the um, substantive components of human rights learning, and that means use of constitutional law, statutory law, um, what does a factual record even mean? I mean, these students haven't even been exposed to NGO reports, state-level government reports, treatises, and we were asked, what is a treatise? I mean, we're talking about really different levels of legal education here, um, as well as the practical components of um, drafting effective petitions and drafting effective complaints. And our goal through this was to really challenge the notion of what it means to have a human rights case. Oftentimes, students hear about public interest litigation, which Jason mentioned, which India is heralded for around the world, and they think you have to go to the Supreme Court. They think you have to go to the High Court. And what we're trying to say is, if you draft an effective complaint at the administrative level against the health department, against the food department, against the labor department, you can make real change. And that's a human rights case. So that's our, that's our goal. And um, in the last two years, we've worked with about 35 students. They've gone for the, many of them, having grown up in Islam, the first time they've entered inside the garden. You saw in that video, he kept referencing outside. The plantations exist as a, this is a plantation. Everything is inside. You don't leave. Theoretically, literally, figuratively, maybe once a week maximum, and that's the village. That's right here. So we're trying to bring people in as well to kind of show what's happening within the gardens. So, so by working together with the law students <laughs> and with the um, community paralegals, we're, our strategy is utilizing administrative remedies. And so I kind of talked a little bit about that already, but really building and kind of pummeling the administrative level departments with effective, well-researched, well-drafted complaints. Moving up another level is, is really looking at the state. And there are certain issues which we all know that are more structural in nature, which are more political in nature, that require different forms of attack. And one of that is the wage fixation process that Francesca referenced, which is this thing that's negotiated between the industry, and the one legalized, recognized union every three years. So we, um, in, the, in 2014, which is when the wage negotiation was up, um, we worked with, we developed a coalition of local groups, including, um, and then our work, uh, Nazdeep, where we basically decided to develop a statewide uh, campaign to demand higher wages. 
And what we did in that is we set up, our role was the delivery of legal trainings to grassroots activists on issues such as labor laws, wage laws, health laws, um, kind of breaking down the legal needs. We then did a lot of work on designing and delivering actual campaign materials that were disseminated across the state. And that was infographics explaining this is how much you earn, this is how much you should earn. Did you know that a state down in Kerala earns 100 more rupees than you, would, you do a day? So kind of bringing comparatives in that way. And then providing strategic advising throughout the campaign. That would be <coughs> writing for op-eds or press releases or um, developing kind of um, media materials that they could disseminate at press conferences. So really thinking about all the different places in which we could come at it. And the effect of that was that about 15,000 activists in almost every district in Assam were collectively campaigning. They were doing bike rallies, they were doing cycle rallies, they were having mass protests. It was coordinated, it was, and they would go and they would talk to media and they wouldn't just say, we need a higher wage, because everybody knows that. But they would say, we need and we demand a higher wage because it violates the Plantation Labor Act, because it violates the Minimum Wages Act because it violates its form of forced labor and that violates the constitutional rights. So it was putting the power of law into that demand. And the effect of it is that there was actually a, a significant increase in the wage. And so that was indisputably um, a success. But as in all things, go to the, next one, the fight doesn't end. And um, I think one of the things to think about is being a lawyer, an effective kind of activist and advocate, is knowing when litigation is right and when litigation is wrong. And here, we didn't opt initially to go straight to the courts, even though there was a clear violation of minimum wage um, uh, standards. And the rationale for that is that the industry is so incredibly powerful. And there are so few organizations working in this region, and the workers are so not they don't have a lot of agency. And so we knew that there was going to be a collective amount of power and influence in the courtroom that we wouldn't be able to really at that point in time kind of respond to. And we thought the better strategy as a group was to go to, go to the ground and try to build up that. But inevitably, um, one of the most successful things that came out of the campaign was not only an increase uh, in wages, but the government finally woke up. They've just been silent in terms of their role of monitoring what the wages should be. And it catalyzed the government to set up the board to look into the issue and re recommend higher minimum wage. Wonderful. What happens? The companies come in and they challenge that notification in the high court. Mm -hmm. So it's about a year and a half after this whole process. We are in the process now of supporting local lawyers. And our role there is helping them get research helping them with drafting, but again, ensuring that there's local ownership in the cases. That's a huge part of what Muslim believes in. And we believe that having waited a year and a half, we've accumulated so much good data, so much economic data, legal research data, that helps to kind of strengthen the case as it is now. Okay, so, and the last framework is really looking at the international level. And in that, I can talk about this later, but we have um, supported a complaint filed at the World Bank's Ombudsman's office CAO office um, regarding Tata's investment in labor um, in tea garden, uh, World Bank's investment in Tata Gardens. We believe in international advocacy. We've hosted roundtables here with other foundations and organizations with certifying agencies like Fair Trade, Rainforest Alliance, who certify Assam tea and we challenge them on their certification standards and what does it constitute to be ethical. <coughs> Um, and we've been working very closely to try to push the media with things like Time Magazine, Guardian, New York Times, Reuters to really elevate what's happening in the gardens to a broader um, population. Um, and all of this together has led us to some pretty significant impacts, we believe. And this is something done with so many more people than are sitting here today. We just have to stress that, that we work with so many more people than who you see here. But um, one is increased community agency. Um, access to tools to challenge power balances and status quo within this space of labor, I already explained kind of the increase for wages. It's opened up a wage negotiation process that was traditionally just with one union. Now three unions sit at a negotiation process. Um, it's really building a consumer consciousness around tea and the global supply chain of tea. Um, and within the health and nutrition service delivery section, we've been able to set up every three months block level 
um, citizen grievance forums where health officials and our paralegals sit together and they would tell them about the cases they've reported and they ask for time bound relief. So that's a real kind of power balance, um, challenging power balances. One of our complaints resulted in 30,000 women um, and children receiving their nutritional in, in, um, entitlements, and that was through one grievance complaint. That was not a high court decision. And just overall improvements in quality of care, um, appointment of skilled personnel, and uh, reduction of corruption within the health care system uh, where we're working. So I just want to end by saying that I think our biggest learning through all of this, and what we wanted to share with you all, is that so much of a legal story happens outside of the courtroom. And I think that really challenges what we as lawyers, what we as law activists are taught. And I think our job is really to seize openings at every level that we can, to reflect and adjust our strategies accordingly, not to be beholden to one thing, um, and really look at that ensuring that the process is community-owned and community-driven in 